Hey folks, my name is Shay Parker and this is RTFM, the show where I teach you how to play a game. And I usually start these things off with a joke or a sketch, but I'm gonna do something a little different today. See, today we're gonna to be learning how to play Pax Premier 2nd Edition, which covers a historical period that is rather glibly referred to as the Great Game, wherein Britain and Russia fought each other directly and indirectly in Afghanistan and the surrounding areas. Now, I'm gonna to try to do what I always do with these videos, which is to make learning a game as enjoyable as possible. But I also wanted to take a moment to recognize the fact that because the setting covers a very messy and complicated period in history, for some, the aftermath of these events are still being felt today. And as such, I'm gonna do my best to be respectful of the peoples and cultures that this game represents, while also keeping in mind that the main purpose of all of this is to have fun while playing a board game. I also wanna compliment Cole Worley for attempting the same thing in the design of this game. It's a difficult line to walk, but the artwork, flavor text, and the afterword in the rulebook show that great care was taken to focus on the people that are at the core of this game. While a lot of the history surrounding this time focuses on the hostilities between Russia and Britain, the wars that were fought were for their own interests, while the Afghan people were largely caught in the crossfire. So it's important to note the players of this game are not cast as any great military power, but as those people that are forced to ally with them in order to have any control over their own livelihood. It shifts the narrative in an important way, and I just wanted to highlight that before diving in. So without further ado, let's learn how to play PAX Premier 2nd Edition. Okay, so before we get started, as always, a couple important things. First off, I try to make these videos as accurate as possible, but sometimes mistakes fall through the cracks. If that happens, I'll be correcting them by using the Klingon subtitles, so please turn those on or check the description box below. And the other thing is that my Patreon backers chose this game for me to teach. If there are games you want me to teach, joining the Patreon is the best way to make that happen. Okay, let's do this. In Pax Pamir, you'll be playing as an Afghan leader trying to forge a new state after the collapse of the Durrani Empire. And because the rest of the world can't leave well enough alone, you'll have to do so by allying with the powerful military forces in the area, that being the British, Russian, or Afghan coalitions. You'll play cards and take actions to send out military units, earn favor with your coalition, and establish your own influence, both on this beautiful cloth map or as spies in other players' courts. These court cards provide you with a lot of options, but hidden in the deck are dominance cards. And when these activate, some players will score points based on their loyalty to a dominant faction or the amount of cylinders they've deployed during the game. If any one player has at least four points more than any other player, they immediately win. As such, it will sometimes be advantageous to change your loyalty if the tide starts to shift. But before we get into all that, let's set things up. First, lay out the map. Don't worry if the corners curl up like this, we'll just say it's part of the aesthetic. Place this favored suit marker on the purple crown and these ruler tokens in each matching region. Next, we're gonna build the draw deck. This is done by first separating out all the event and dominance cards and then making six piles, each having five court cards plus one for each player. So if we're setting up for a three player game, that's eight court cards per pile. You'll have extras, just leave them in the box. Then place one event card in the second to the sixth piles, another event in pile two, and the four dominance cards in piles three through six. Shuffle each pile individually and place them on top of each other in order with pile one on top. Then you'll put out the market board and start drawing court cards. And whenever you place cards into the market, always start from the left and fill each column top to bottom. Once the cards are set out, give each player four rupees along with their board and cylinders. Place the fancy one on the score track and the rest on your board. Put the rest of the coins and the coalition blocks nearby and now it's time to choose your loyalty. Each player will get a loyalty disc, and starting with a random player and going clockwise, you'll choose which faction you want to ally with at the beginning of the game. You won't be holding to this faction, but it is still an important choice. Of course, how to make this choice will be clearer once you've learned the rest of the game. Anyway, the last player to choose their loyalty will be the first player to take their turn, meaning that we're basically ready to get started, but really quickly, I want to mention that if you're playing a solo or two-player game, there's a bit more setup. However, I'll be covering all the rules for that in a separate video. Okay, so gameplay in Pax Premier is mostly pretty straightforward, at least mechanically. Strategically, there can be a lot to take in, but don't worry about that just yet. On your turn, you can take two actions, but while each court card will grant some kind of action, until you actually control them, you only have two choices, purchase and play, which are pretty much exactly what they sound like. Purchasing allows you to buy a card from the market, and playing allows you to put it into your court. Many cards will have symbols on the side known as impact icons, and these will trigger as soon as you play the card, but I'll talk more about what they do in just a bit. Once you've played a card, you have the option of using one of its actions, but keep in mind your two action limit. That being said, if your card matches the favored suit, you may use one of its abilities without spending an action. Suits also have other functions and can tell you about the general vibe of the card, all of which I'll get to in time. Anyway, once you've finished your turn, you'll perform cleanup, which involves discarding excess cards from your hand and court, activating any events or dominance cards in the leftmost row, and refilling the market. 
You'll continue on like this until the game ends, either by one player leading everyone else by at least four points, or when the final dominance card is triggered. Now with all that in mind, let's go in depth with player turns by talking about those purchase and play actions. So there are a couple reasons that I'm giving these two basic actions a section all to themselves. First, they're just the most important actions in the game, so it's best to cover them in depth before moving on to anything else. Second, there are a lot of key concepts that are tied to these actions, so every once in a while when they come up, I'm going to branch off a bit to discuss them. Now let's go shopping. You start off with 4 rupees, and this game has a mostly closed economy, so when you buy a card, instead of paying to the bank, you put your rupees onto the market, one on each card to the left of the one you purchased. And as you can see, this will add up to the cost shown above the card. Also, if there is an empty space where you would place a rupee, place it in the other card in the column instead. Now when you buy a core card, it will go right into your hand, but if you buy an event or dominance card, trigger the when purchased ability on the bottom. I'll talk about events and dominance cards a little later though. For now, here are just a few more things to keep in mind about purchasing. First, you can't purchase a card if you've placed rupees on it this turn. The reason that's important is thing number two. If there are rupees on a card from a previous turn, if you buy that card, you'll gain those rupees. But you need to be able to pay the cost of the card before picking it up. You can't use the money on the card to help pay for it. And lastly, if the red military suit is favored, the cost for each card is doubled. When this is the case, place two rupees on each card to the left instead of one. I'm going to talk more about favored suits a little later though, because military is the only suit that has an effect like this. Just know that it's something to remember. So now that you've gotten a card, you'll probably want to play it. Once the board gets a little more crowded, you might need to pay a cost, but at the start of the game, you simply take an action and put the card into your court. If you already have cards in your court, choose the left or right side to place the new one. You can't play cards into the middle or rearrange your court, and positioning will matter a little bit later on. Whichever side you picked, now it's time to look at the impact icons. These symbols on the right will be a big part of why you played the card in the first place. If you see these scales, take two rupees from the bank. This is not just free money though, it's more like a loan, and this card is referred to as being leveraged. What this means is that if you ever discard this card, you'll have to pay those two coins back. And if you can't afford to, you'll have to discard a card from your hand or court for each rupee you can't pay. If you see a block, either on its side with a camel or standing up with a gun, these are telling you to place a road or an army respectively. Armies go into the region shown on the card, roads go in between that region and an adjacent one. As you can see, they use the same component, just standing up or lying down. And assuming the symbol is gray, that means you'll place the blocks matching your current loyalty. If you're out of matching blocks in the supply, you have to take one from the map and place it where you need it, even if it wasn't the same type. Now some cards are patriots, shown by the colored bar along the middle, and must play the blocks matching their color. The patriots will earn you favor with their coalition, but you can't double dip. So if you ever gain a patriot that doesn't match your loyalty, you have to switch loyalties and discard all other patriots in your court. I should also mention that you can only change loyalties by gaining influence with a different coalition. You can't just switch whenever you feel like it. You can also earn influence through prizes and gifts, which I'll talk more about later, but if you switch loyalties, you'll have to discard all those too. I know a new relationship can seem exciting and fun, but you should keep in mind what you'll be giving up before rushing into things, no matter what kind of bedroom eyes they're giving you. Now if you see a cylinder sitting on a rectangle, this will have you placing one of your cylinders as a spy on a card in any player's court that matches the card's region. Similarly, a cylinder with a crown will have you placing the piece onto the map as a tribe in the matching region. Placing spies and tribes will help you in a lot of ways, especially when it comes to earning money. Spies will come up later when we talk about actions, so let's look at the map first. If you have at least one tribe in a region and a plurality of ruling pieces there, you will then rule that region. Ruling pieces are a combination of tribes and armies matching your loyalty, and having a plurality means that you have more than any other player in that region. Here's an example. Let's say we're loyal to the British and have three tribes in Punjab. Red is also loyal to Britain, but they only have two tribes here. Black is loyal to Russia, which has more armies, but since they only have one tribe, their total is three ruling pieces, which doesn't beat our four. Since we have the plurality, we rule the region and take this ruling token to show it. If we were tied for the most, or if another coalition had enough armies to beat our total, even if there are no other tribes there, no one would rule. These conditions are constantly in place, so if you ever lose the plurality, you lose the token. There are a few reasons ruling a region is important, but one of the big ones is because if anyone wants to play a card whose region is one that you rule, they must pay you a bribe in order to do so. The bribe is equal to the number of tribes you have in the ruled region, but you can waive some or all of the bribe if you want to. Negotiation is definitely allowed, but you can't give each other money unless the rules explicitly state it, and you can never give each other cards. 
Still, as I'm sure you can imagine, ruling a region is pretty cool. But there's a very important rule about tribes and the cards that put them on the board. First off, these purple political cards are the only ones that have this impact icon, and they are linked even after being played. See, if you ever lose the last tribe in a region, you are overthrown and have to discard every matching political card in your court. Likewise, if you lose the last political card of a region, all tribes in that space go back to your board. Having the most cylinders out is one of the main ways to get points, so you'll want to protect them, but we'll go over how to do that real soon. And the last impact icon to cover are the favored suits. If you play a card with one of these, change the favored suit to the matching color. We've mentioned the cost increase that comes from military, but the favored suit mostly lets you take card-based actions for free. So let's talk about those next. So yes, purchase and play are the two big actions, but almost every card has at least one action associated with it, shown in squares on the bottom. If the suit on the card does not match the favored suit, you can spend one of your two actions to activate the card and use one of its abilities. If the favorite suit does match the card, this will be considered a bonus action and doesn't count against your two action limit, but any other cost will still accrue. Regardless of the favorite suit, you can only use each card once per turn. So even if it has multiple actions, you'll have to pick and ignore the rest until your turn comes around again. And it's also worth noting that if another player has more spies on one of your cards than anyone else, they hold your card hostage, and so you have to pay them a bribe if you want to use that card's actions. Just like ruling a region, the bribe's cost is equal to the number of spies on the card, but the hostage holder can waive some or all of the bribe if they're feeling generous. Okay, now let's talk about what these cards can do. Since we mentioned spies, let's start with them. Besides holding cards hostage, having spies on a card is scary because of the betray action, which allows you to destroy cards outright. First off, let's look at the cost, which is shown next to the action. We have to pay two rupees to betray, but instead of paying to the bank, whenever you pay for a card action, you'll place the coins onto the market, starting at the rightmost space and placing a coin on each card in a column, moving left if the cost is higher than two. If there are any vacant slots, skip the space and place your rupee on the next card in the row. And remember the rule about not being able to buy cards that you've put a coin on this turn, because that applies no matter how the rupee got there. Also, if you're near the end of the game and there aren't enough cards to fully do this, the excess rupees get returned to the box. So once we've done this, we can take that betray action. Find a card with one of your spies, remove the card from the game, and return all spies on it, including yours, back to their owner's player boards. This can trigger an overthrow like we talked about or destroy a leveraged card, forcing the owner to pay back their loan. Also, some cards can be taken as prizes. If the thin line on the bottom shows a coalition, you can place it beneath your loyalty dial. This will give you influence with that coalition, which will help you if your side wins a dominance check, but if you take a prize that doesn't match, you'll have to change loyalties, losing everything that gave you influence with the old coalition, same as when we talked about Patriot cards. Taking a prize is optional though, so you won't have to worry about switching loyalties if you don't want to. Okay, so spies seem dangerous already, but they're not done yet. They can also move to other cards and battle each other. These two actions apply to armies as well, but I'll cover spies first. When you play a move action, you can move a spy to an adjacent card a number of times equal to the number of flags on the action. You can spend all of your move on one spy or split them up, and cards on the ends of your court are adjacent to the closest card of your neighbor's court, so it's not too hard to just slide right in and take a card hostage. If you take a battle action, regardless of the number of explosions, you'll only have one battle. Choose a court card with at least one of yours and another player's spies you can remove a number of their spies equal to the number of explosions if you have at least that many of your own spies in the fight. So here we've got this double boomer and we want to fight these red spies. There are two of them there, but we only have one spy, which takes out one of theirs and then the second boom goes unblasted. Similarly, if the action only had one battle icon, we could only remove one enemy spy regardless of how many we had in the fight. Now that's all for spies, so let's head to the map and talk about armies and roads. Going in reverse, if you take a battle action, you can start a fight in a single region with armies that match your loyalty. This works almost exactly like spy fights, but you can target enemy armies, roads, or even other players' tribes. And there are also two exceptions. First, you can't target the tribes of another player who shares your loyalty. And second, you can't destroy armies or roads uh, of the coalition that you're loyal to. I know it seems weird that you would ever want to, but there are situations in which it would be advantageous, so just remember that you can't. Moving on, if you want to do a war, you got to be able to move your blocks around. Pretty sure Sun Tzu said that. So taking the move action will be pretty helpful. Moving allows you to move a number of armies equal to the strength of the action to adjacent regions, but they can only do so if there's a road matching their coalition connecting them. And the last thing about armies and roads is that while you can get them for free by playing cards, you can also build them. 
This action lets you build one, two, or three armies and or roads in any regions that you rule by paying two, four, or six rupees. Again, the costs are paid to the market like we've seen. So that was all about violence and warfare. What about the more subtle forms of aggression? Well, the next two actions are all about that. Starting with gifts, these are the last way to influence the coalition you're loyal to. And if you look at your dial, you'll see three slots in which to place your gifts and how much each gift will cost. So your first gift will cost two, then four, then six. This is good for influence, like I said, but because it does so by placing one of your cylinders, it actually helps towards scoring points in two different ways. I know I've mentioned scoring in a general sense, and we're very close to talking about the specifics, but first we have to cover the last card-based action, taxation. This allows you to take rupees from the market and other players. If there are coins on the market, you can just take them, but you can only take coins from other players if they have cards in their court that match a region that you rule. And you can mix and match where you take coins from, so long as the total doesn't surpass the number of coins on the card. Of course, you'll probably want to defend yourself from other players taxing you. To do that, you're going to want to set up a tax shelter, which in this game is not even a little bit shady, don't worry about it. Now, you've probably noticed the stars on each card below their suit. Eagle-eyed viewers might have even noticed that the strength of certain card actions is directly linked to how many stars they have, but there's one more thing to know, and it's different for each suit. Orange stars will set up tax shelters, meaning that for each orange star in your court, that many rupees cannot be taken from you. So if I've got three orange stars and four coins, you could only take one of them before you need to start looking elsewhere. The other stars are pretty simple. Blue stars increase your hand limit, which is normally two. Purple stars increase your court limit, which is normally three. And red stars don't do anything during the game, but they'll help decide the winner if there's a tie at the end. We're almost ready to move on to cleanup, but there's one last thing to mention. Some cards have special abilities printed on them, the effects of which are all printed on the card and can be pretty handy. They're passive, so using them doesn't cost an action, nor does it stop you from using any actions on the card. They also can't be held hostage, so even if you're lousy with spies, the ability will still be in effect. Okay, let's move on to cleanup and winning the game. So once you're done with your two actions and any bonus actions you want to take, it's time to clean up, which has four main steps. First off, check how many cards you have in your court. If it's more than three, choose and discard until you're at three. That is, unless you have any political cards out like we mentioned. For each purple star, you can keep one more card in your court. Keep in mind that losing cards during cleanup can still trigger leverage and overthrow effects, so choose wisely. Also, if you discard a purple card, that will decrease your court limit, which means you'll have to lose even more cards. Next, you discard down to your hand limit. This is normally two, but each blue star will increase it by one. Of course, discarding cards from your hand doesn't have any other negative effects, besides the loss of what might have been. I'm sorry, John Francois. Your beard is glorious, but it never would have worked out between us. Yeet. Anyway, after those two, we look at the market. If there are any events in either of the far left spaces, they will be discarded and their when discarded effect will trigger. These hit everyone or affect the game in some way, like changing the favored suit. They're all pretty self-explanatory, so just look at the card and see what happens. And if there are any rupees on the card, they'll stay in the market space. Then you'll slide all the cards to the left, placing any rupees on the board onto the card that takes its place, and refilling the market left to right, top to bottom. This will all go pretty quickly, but there's one thing that can happen which will shake things up, and it has to do with dominance cards. These red guys will show up, and as long as they're on the board, they can be bought just like any other event card. They'll also get discarded like any event card, but either way, it'll trigger a dominance check, which I'll talk about in just a moment. The other way a dominance check can occur is through instability. If two dominance cards are ever on the market at the same time, you immediately check dominance and discard both cards, refilling the market as normal. So how does dominance work? Well, let's take a look at the map and see. When a dominance check occurs, count how many blocks of each coalition are on the map. It doesn't matter whether they're armies or roads, just that they've been deployed. In fact, it might be easier to look at your supply to see how many haven't been put out. A faction is dominant if they have at least four more blocks on the map than any other. Since Britain has 10 bricks out and the others only have four and five, Britain completes this requirement and is considered dominant. This means that the check is successful, and so now we want to look at who has the most influence with the dominant faction. We've talked about this a few times, but to recap, you gain one point of influence for the following things. Being loyal to the faction, each patriot in your court, each prize you've taken, and each gift you've given. Whoever has the most influence is the coalition's best friend and scores five points. Second most gets three points, and third most gets one point. But of course, you have to at least be loyal to the faction to get anything. If there's a tie, combine the points for the tied places and divide by the number of tied players, rounding down. So if two players are tied for first, they'll each get four points, then the next player will be in third and will get one. Once all the points are awarded, the region settles into an uneasy piece, which means that every block on the map is removed. 
And notice I only said block, all the tribes stick around. But let's say that the dominance check was unsuccessful, meaning that no faction had at least four more blocks than any other. In this case, every player counts how many cylinders they've removed from their player board. It doesn't matter whether they're tribes, spies, or gifts. If you've placed it somewhere, it counts. Whoever has the most cylinders in play scores three points, second most gets one, and you settle ties the same way as with a successful check. However, after an unsuccessful check, the blocks remain where they are and the wars keep waging. As a reminder, after scoring, if any player ever has at least four more points than anyone else, they immediately win. If that doesn't happen, keep playing until it does or until the final dominance check is over, after which whoever has the highest score wins. Also, the final check is worth double the amount of points, so you'll likely have an outright winner, but if you don't, the winner is whichever tied player has the most red military stars in their court. If it's still tied, whichever tied player has the most rupees, and the last tiebreaker is whoever can cook the best Chopin kebab. Hmm. Pretty good. And that's how you play Pax Pamir. Hopefully this will help you get it to the table, and if you're interested in learning how to add the AI player Wakan for a solo or two player game, I've got a special video just for that. My Patreon backers have the chance to watch it right now, but for everyone else, it'll go live in 30 days, shortly followed by a beginner strategy guide. And speaking of Patreon, my rules lawyers have voted on what game I should teach next, and it looks like it's gonna be Star Trek Ascendancy. I'm really looking forward to using that video to find out which Star Trek series is objectively the best and why it's Deep Space Nine. Bye!